name is John Kolko. I'm the founder and director of Austin Center for Design, which is a one-year graduate program. We teach interaction design and social entrepreneurship. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit today around design. Um, and I want to talk specifically around uh, how I get my clicker to work here. Clicker? Clicker tech support? <laughs> oh, there it goes. Success. Um, I want to talk specifically about um, four elements uh, of design that I teach um, students. Uh, and then I want to show some examples about how they apply that. Okay, so we'll start with this idea of craft or craftsmanship. Um, and uh, craft is difficult to talk about. I think for a lot of people, um, they think about craft like this, right? So like uh, trinkets, um, you know, the wooden mallard duck that you might find on the shelf in middle America, right? Um, that's, that's sort of the start and, start and end of it because they picture somebody like this actually doing the work, a craftsman in his, you know, cobbling or something like that. Um, but this is craft too, uh, and there's some, some nuance and specificity to the detail that makes us sort of in love with these types of objects. Um, that craftsmanship comes through in industrial design, it comes through in graphic design, it comes through in architecture, it comes through in all of, all of the arts and crafts, if you'd like. Um, and there's been a number of people that have talked about this as, um, as quality and engagement. Um, Melga McCall has written a book called Abstracting Craft. It's a great book. Um, and he talks about how craft is specifically a reflection of engagement. Um, I think he's talking about the engagement that the designer has with the thing they're making. That there's a very sort of um, intimate connection uh, between the maker and the, the, uh, the output. Um, my friend Alan Cooper uh, has, has sort of a, a tangentially um, uh, aligned view of this, which is he talks about it as quality. He says, craftsmanship is all about quality. The goal is to get it right, not to get it fast. And that seems a little bit at odds with some of the things we've been hearing about with lean. Um, it also seems a little bit at odds with the idea of uh, time to market, um, first to market, and sort of all of the other um, rhetoric and conversation that surrounds business today. Um, and so for me, uh, craft is about quality and engagement. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about what you're um, actually having craft with, which is this idea of materiality. Um, it was alluded that I um, have, have done ceramics for a number of years, and this is, believe it or not, the material of ceramics. It looks like mud. It's actually clay, right? Um, and then eventually it looks like this, and eventually it starts to look like this. Um, and you buy the stuff, you use it, and you become intimate with it. And so a craftsperson, a designer, an artist, um, gets to know the material really, really well. Um, really, really well means 10, 15, 20, 30 years worth of really, really well. This isn't an overnight success. It's not something that happens in an instant. That seems like really hard work. It is really hard work, and I think most of the craftspeople you know agree with, uh, with that idea. Um, one of my favorite artists is a guy named Elbrith Durr, um, and he talks about uh, genuine forms of nature. Um, simplicity is the greatest adornment of art. Um, this is a piece of his um, that, that I'm, um, I have tattooed on my back, and so as a point of reference, uh, don't get a woodcut tattooed on your back. It's not a great experience. Um, but anyway, look at the detail of this thing, right? The, the, um, the nuance and subtlety of, of the craft and the intimacy he must have with understanding what the material can do. And that comes from years and years and years of experience. Um, and so uh, for me, material is about this appropriateness. Um, and that's gained through experience. Um, there's a tendency for what the material wants to do. And you only become familiar with that the longer you spend with the material. The third sort of piece of this story to me is this notion of process. Um, I grew up with these in my um, living room when I was a kid. And I thought they were the ugliest things in the world. Turns out I have no taste and my parents do. But this is the Eames chair. Uh, and it's actually considered a, a really sort of good piece of design and, and color me surprised in my later years. But these are the sketches that Charles and Ray Eames um, did on, on route to building that chair and fabricating it. And it wasn't just sketches because they also built uh, um, uh, these, these casts in order to, to try and understand what the material can do and really get sort of familiar with the, the, um, the making. Um, this is really different than sitting in front of a computer, isn't it? Right? They're really intimate with the, the things that they're building. Um, they did uh, videos as well, and this is obviously prior to a lot of uh, advanced technology, and this is the way that they planned their videos. Right? They did ex exhibitions. This is how they walked through what's it going to feel like when we're in an exhibit space. Okay? Um, and um, for me, one of my, uh, my, one of my favorite pictures is this one, because on the wall behind them is a timeline. It looks like After Effects, right? It looks like the Flash timeline. It's a timeline for one of their videos. Okay, so early on, before we had sort of the technology that helped them do what they wanted to do, uh, they, they were pinning this stuff up on the wall. 
uh, to really understand how this medium, the material, the craft, the things I've talked about work together. Um, it's a process, right? And it's a, it's a time-consuming process, and it's arduous, and I think that um, we're kidding ourselves if we start to talk about doing it quickly, because the work that comes out of that hard work and process and long time frame is amazing, and we all recognize it. Charles Eames says that process is not magic, and for me, what I think he's saying is it's hard work, and there's no shortcuts around it. Um, the last piece of this story is voice, and this is sort of the most ethereal to talk about, but I'll, sh I'll show it by means of example. Um, this is Anthony Gormley's work. Has anybody seen this in person? It's amazing. I mean, imagine these little guys. Here, I'll zoom in. Imagine these little guys looking at you, this whole room full of them, right? One more time, I think, yeah. Like, what do they want? What do they want with you, <laughs> right? They, what are they doing? Uh, and and um, so he's written sort of a diatribe around what his work means. Um, and, and just one quote from this, he says, um, I've used all the resources of mass production to undermine the central ethos of mass production. He has a, he has a statement, right? And we think about the artist's statement um, as, as being sort of a reason for his work to exist. Okay, so there's a statement here. There's a reason or a voice or a message behind the work that he's doing. Okay, so if all of this becomes design, uh, then this should be the stuff that we build up an expertise in. Um, and I think that, that many of us who went to design school did. Um, but there's another piece of this story, too, because when we start to aim this thing, like I think of it like I'm, I'm looking through a, like a gun or a, or a um, telescope or something like that. We can aim it at something. Um, you get some interesting results. You can aim it at all sorts of places. You can aim this thing at your startup, right? And it will amplify. You can aim it at your corporation, and it will amplify. Um, you can aim it at social problems, and it will amplify. But in its amplification, there's a downside. It becomes uh, uh, diffuse, right? It becomes um, fleeting because you lose control. A lot of what we're talking about with this brand equity stuff uh, is unleashing a message in the world. A craftsman controls every single pot they throw. A designer doesn't. Right? We use things like mass production or digital technology to enhance our message, to amplify it, and we lose some control over it. It becomes diffused. Um, it's ultimately powerful, but it's powerful whether or not we're doing a good job. And so that comes with some responsibility. And so for me, the big question uh, sort of of all of this is where do you aim the powerful force? Once you gain this expertise and craft, what do you do with it? Um, that's, a, that's a choice, right? It's a choice of subject matter. Um, and as long as I've been a practitioner, um, subject matter has been off the table. You can critique uh, any of the other elements I talked about. You can critique aesthetic, you can critique follow through, you can critique narrative, you can critique message, but you're not allowed to critique subject matter. You're not allowed to say to a telecom company, your products are not worth building. But I think it should be fair game. I think that we should be able to say things like, when we aim all of this stuff, subject matter is part and parcel of our conversation. We should have a vocabulary around critiquing where are you aiming this creative process. Okay? And I want to show a little bit about how that plays out um, when we answer this question of um, how can you gain control over subject matter. Um, so the second half of this, I want to give um, sort of more concrete examples because I think this is all very theoretical and it's nice to hear me muse about it, but, but how do you do anything with that? Um, and so I'll start with, uh, um, with uh, showing you two of my students. Um, that's Eric Boggs on the top, uh, Chuck on the, uh, Eric Boggs on the bottom, Chuck on the top. And um, part of their process that they learn at the school, Austin Center for Design, is um, to immerse yourself in a problem space. Um, and immerse means immerse. They spent two or three months um, looking at what it's like to get old. Um, it came from a, um, the, the impetus and passion for this came from one of them um, having a family member who's growing old um, and, and noting some of the complexities around that. These are images that they took from some of their participants. Um, and I suppose there's sort of a, like a non sequitur here of like, wow, old people use technology. Uh, okay, that's interesting. That's not really insightful. Um, but, uh, but this is the types of images they took. And what you're seeing here is actually an elderly woman uh, who, who is taken by her, um, uh, her daughter to an art class once a week. Okay? And if you think about your grandparents or maybe even your parents, um, you start to think about the things they do in their lives as they get older. There's an awful lot of sort of um, regimented, you're going to the doctor, you're going to art class. Um, this is a woman uh, sharing some of her photos and uh, memories, um, and she had actually gotten on Facebook in order to, um, to, uh, to understand what her grand uh, granddaughter was up to. Right? So she had, she had sort of plowed her way through all of this foreign technology in order to do something emotionally meaningful. Um, where they arrived um, was with a product called CareWell, 
Um, and CareWell is an app that allows family members to come together to take care of grandma or grandpa. It's a small, closed, private social community that says, hey, grandma hasn't seen you in a while. Do you want to be the one to drive her to her doctor's appointment? Or, hey, I'm not going to be able to take her to Mahjong. Uh, can you fill in for me? Okay, so it's a simple problem, and it's a simple solution. Um, and it's a problem and a solution set that came from a process that's um, qualitative. It came from marinating in it. It came from um, detail, and it came from an understanding of all of those four elements that I spoke of as design. Um, and when I talked to Chuck and Eric about it, they said, I'll, I'll use their full quote here, caregivers demonstrate a strong tendency to isolate, uh, to become overly self-reliant, and to burn out. CareWell helps with the intimidating and overwhelming part of asking for help. As families use our system to request and receive help, we offer them a new perspective on collaboration. Um, for the two of them, uh, they used a theory of change model. Okay, and many of you might be familiar with that from policy circles. But this is the idea of saying, um, if we uh, do something small now, how our short-term inputs, um, how will they react in the long term? How will this actually change what it means to get old? Um, it's about stating hypotheses related to behavior change. Uh, and I want to show you what it looks like. Um, in this case, the inputs are the creative resources it takes Eric and Chuck to make the product. Um, the output is this mobile uh, task coordination tool, very simple mobile product. Um, but they have larger aspirations for it. Um, their goal is fundamentally um, to uh, help families um, understand and deal with the unwieldiness of having someone in their family that they love get old. Um, or it's about achieving aging in place, a larger social construct of not having to go to a nursing home. Um, or it's fundamentally about affording um, people to live, age, and die with dignity. And so we get to some big ideas out of some very small inputs. Um, and I, I don't know if you get there with sort of this um, grip it and rip it approach to design. I think it comes methodically, and it comes through marinating. Um, I'll give you another example here. Um, this is Diana on the top and Cheyenne Weaver on the bottom, two of my students. And um, they, uh, they conducted months and months of research with teenage girls trying to understand eating disorders. Um, and so they talked to dietitians, they talked to nutritionists, they talked to therapists, they talked to teenage girls. Um, and uh, here's some, some images that you'll see. Um, this is the therapist talking through some of the, the ways that she counsels um, students. Um, these are some, some girls. Um, it's a little difficult to see on the screen there, but they're actually designing a lamp. This was part of a workshop where she got girls with eating disorders together um, and under the auspices of let's build things. Um, and so uh, dramatically sort of recontextualizing uh, sort of a, a social problem and saying, like, let's, let's ignore it for the time being and focus instead on making. Um, and they came to, uh, and I think I got a couple more pictures here. She's actually drawing a little lamp there. Um, they came to this, this service called Girls Guild, and it's a basic, basic idea that actually is really, really powerful. Um, they came to the conclusion, the conclusive insight that teenage girls' eating disorders is actually very, uh, has very little to do with food. Um, it has a lot to do with control, uh, and it has a lot to do with um, understanding identity and your place in the world. Uh, and so what they uh, arrived at is, well, hey, if we can give um, students who might be at this, uh, girls who might be at this point in their life uh, a um, strong female mentor, um, and we can give them something that's craft-based where they can have a high amount of physical dexterity control over it, maybe we get success. Maybe we see some sort of social change that's positive. Okay, so they tried it, right? Um, and when I talked to them about um, what it's like to run their own company, uh, because Girls Guild is their, their own company, um, they say, as an entrepreneur, all the decision making at the inception of your service falls to you. Design, business, marketing, PR. Well, that's an enormous responsibility. It's also a benefit, and it allows you to maintain your vision for your product across each stage of development. For them, there's a vision. There's a trajectory. And it's deeply focused on having a positive social impact. Uh, it, again, it's not grip it and rip it. They're social entrepreneurs, um, and they have sort of a, a method um, and a velocity to the types of things that they're trying to do. Um, for them, they're taking on risk. They're taking on more risk than they would be taking on, um, I think, if they went to a consultancy. Um, but they're taking on, uh, they're able to reap the rewards of that. Um, for a regular entrepreneur, that reward is, is money. Um, social entrepreneurs have a double bottom line. You identify humanitarian opportunities, you take on risk, um, and that reward uh, has two facets to it, profit and impact. I don't think that I'm, I'm saying anything new to y'all because here you are at the uh, social impact innovation session, um, but for me, uh, you start to see examples of this in everyday life and you start to understand that actually this takes a lot more control um, and um, a lot more detail and I think, again, a lot more time to get right. This isn't something that you can do overnight. 
Um, Arabin is another great example of, of this sort of at scale and how it might work when you start to look at big, big, intractable problems. Social entrepreneurship is a way for you to control that subject matter. The theory of change is a way for you to structure that subject matter's goal and vision. And ultimately, all of those ingredients that I spoke about come together uh, as a trajectory for making change. Um, I'll leave you with quotes from, um, from these students again as a point of summary. Um, they said, designers practice an incredible practical form of empathy. We make real world things and processes that alleviate the core fears, anxieties, and lacks that people feel. Okay? The process that defines commercial design and design for social change are identical. The exact same process that one might use to drive profit and revenue is the process that they're using to drive social change. Um, when I talked to Diana about Girls Guild, she said, uh, as an entrepreneur with full control over the design and implementation of your product, uh, you have the opportunity, and I would argue the responsibility, uh, to create something with a larger goal of affecting more positive, meaningful, uh, and lasting behavioral change. Okay? Um, and so if we put all of this together, we have these ideas of craft, material, process, and voice, um, which have always been sort of the um, suitcase of pieces and parts for a designer to make change uh, in the world. Um, and I would argue that now we need to um, focus on subject matter as well. We need to begin to critique it. We, we need to begin to aim it in a more powerful uh, and, and purposeful manner. Um, and fundamentally, we need to answer and ask and answer the question, what problem will you choose to, uh, to work on? Um, so thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you.